Many of us just want the answers. And this morning I want to talk to you about the sentence, in the beginning, God. You see, we all have to answer this question. We'll talk about worldviews at another point in time, but we all have a worldview, whether you think you do or you don't. We all have a worldview, and that is basically uh, we have a system that allows us to view the world around us. And by that, we conduct our lives. But we have to begin to answer questions. No matter what our worldview is, no matter what our belief system is, we have to answer some pretty important questions. One of them is origins. How did we get here? Believe it or not, you're not a figment of my imagination. Thank God, because you're all wonderful looking people. You're not a figment of my imagination. You're actually here and we all have origins. We have to answer questions like destiny and morality. And I answer all those questions by ending that sentence with God. And not just any God, but the God of the Bible. I make no bones this morning, I believe in God. I am not ashamed to admit that I believe in God. And if you think that coming to church means you check your brain out at the door, you leave reason and logic at the door, I would argue against that. I'm a Christian because I have good reasons in believing in the God of the Bible and I want to share some of them with you today. I want to skim the surface and I'm not going to go too deep into it this morning, but I want to ask everybody, how do you end the sentence in the beginning? And if you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I've never bothered to answer that question, I want to help you answer that question this morning. If you're sitting here this morning and saying, I surrendered to Jesus many years ago and I've been a Christian for 15 years, can I tell you that however we end that sentence holds huge implications for every one of us. How we conduct our lives after we end that sentence with God has huge implications. Has anybody here ever watched the movie The Equaliser? Yeah, Denzel Washington. I'm just a fan of Denzel Washington, by the way. I, I love the characters he portrays. Equaliser 2's out, so myself and Ruben have booked her. Well, I think we're going to that. And uh, uh, I remember watching the other one just, just last week, actually. The, the first one was out, and I remember a scene, you know, it paints the picture of who this guy is that Denzel Washington's playing. He's, he's got a bit of history. He's not just a guy that works at a hardware store. We get that pretty early on. And he's sitting in a cafe, as he does every night at 2 a.m., reading books, which is a promise he made to his wife before she passed away. But it gives him the opportunity to bump into some different people that are randomly in and out of the cafe at that time of night. And I, I remember a, a scene that really pressed upon me when there's a lady who, uh, engaging in the world's oldest trade, comes in for breaks in and out of the cafe and finally strikes up a conversation with the man that's played by Denzel Washington. And he says to her, he says, what have you always wanted to be? Is this what you've really always wanted to do? And she said, well, no. She said, I've always wanted to be a singer. And he said to her, he said, you know what? You can be whatever you want to be. And she scoffed and she laughed and she said, maybe in your world, that's the case. And he said, change your world. You know what? Just like that girl, so many of us get penned in by circumstances. Perhaps we get hemmed in by our past. Perhaps we get hemmed in by guilt that we can't let go of. And I want to tell you this morning, you may not have the power to change your world, but I know somebody who can help you do it. None of us can change our world. Ravi Zacharias says that God makes appointments with us in our disappointments. And to see the pattern, we must take three steps involving the heart, the mind, and the cross. And I want to help everybody in this room this morning take those three steps. Before we get to some evidence, I want to ask a question here of everybody in the room. Do we really want to end that sentence with anything else apart from God? In the beginning, nothing. Do we really want what atheism offers? Do we really want that as a society? There is a push in modern times to remove God from everywhere. Let's, let's get God out of schools. Let's get God out of our curriculum. Let's get God out of our parliament. 
We don't want God to tell us how we can get married or how we conduct our lives. We don't want God. Science has removed God. Quite to the contrary. Science is highlighting God. The implications of what scientists are now finding are huge. But do we really want to answer that question with anything else? You see... If you don't have God, nobody has a moral compass or nobody really has a magnetic north that we can put on the moral compass. You know, you take God, this is an extreme example, but you take God off the end of that sentence and what happened in World War II was not evil, it's just a difference in opinion. Because no German acted outside of their laws in World War II. They had instituted a law and every one of them thought they were doing the right thing. Everybody thought, let's kill out the lower gene pool so that we can have the superior gene pool. Do we really want to remove God from our society? When we look at it under a microscope, perhaps we see it's actually God that's holding the fabric of our society together right now. Otherwise, we'd all just tear each other apart. Everybody would press the button on the nuke button and we'd be all gone. Do we really want to remove God? We have no God, no morality. The next one, and this is a big one for me, if you don't have God at the end of that sentence, we're all a product of randomness and chance. The kind of randomness and chance that no mathematician can actually come up with a sum for, try as they might. They say the the numbers are that far-fetched that it could not possibly happen by randomness and chance. But if we're all a product of randomness and chance, then just like atheism, it leaves us all adrift on an ocean with no purpose and no meaning. If you don't have God at the end of the sentence of in the beginning, then you came here by accident and it's survival of the fittest. But I've got some good news for you this morning. The truth is that God does exist and belong at the end of that sentence. And for that reason, we can read in Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14, that God put us all together in the womb. kind of changes how you treat other people when you realise that God fashioned and put together every person the same in the womb. My Bible tells me that God fearfully and wonderfully made each and every single one of us. If you're sitting here this morning, congratulations. You are not an accident. You are the forethought of an awesome God. We don't want anybody to check out of life. We want you here as long as we can have you here as well. Job 31 tells us that he made me in the womb. This is a guy sitting on a heap of ashes with boils all over him. And he says, God made me in the womb. And he fashioned me. And the apostles would say in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, that Jesus is the author of life. If Jesus is the author of life, who's writing your story this morning? He's a good God, and I don't mind declaring that. Before we remove God too much further from society in our own lives, we should take the warnings of G.K. Chesterton, who said to get our hands off the fence. See, G.K. Chesterton, that wonderful wordsmith of the early 19th century, a journalist, said, before any man removes a fence, they should pause long enough to ask, why was it put there in the first place? Before anybody removes God any further out of society, perhaps we should just pause long enough to ask ourselves, why did we put him there in the first place? Let's move on to some evidence for God. Is there good evidence to believe in God? Can we rationally, reasonably and logically uh, look at evidence that points to the existence of God? Yes, we do. Yes, there is evidence for God. I want to ask everybody in this room this morning, why is it that God is always the crazy option? Right now, you're sitting on a rock, spinning at 68,000 miles an hour, orbiting the sun in exactly the same pattern it has done for years upon years upon years. If it's randomness and chance, friends, you could spin out of control any moment. If you don't have God, we have everything coming into being from nothing. We can't control anything, but there is regularity in the universe. There is a, the sun comes up. Have you ever noticed that? 
The sun rises every morning, just like it has for thousands of years. The sun will go down, just like it has for thousands of years. Winter will pass, praise God. Summer will come, look out. (laughs) But it's been doing that for thousands of years and none of us in this room have got any control over it. Can't even control when it rains. They try to in Tasmania with cloud seeding and they mess it up every time. But I want to ask you, why is it that we're viewed the crazy ones? Why is it that if I believe in God, I'm the one that gets laughed at? Why is it that they will stand up in the public arena and taunt Christians as if we're the crazy ones? Friends, if you want my personal opinion, it takes more faith to believe in atheism than it does that God spoke anything into existence. For you to stand there and say there is no God and everything came from nothing, that takes more faith. That's a crazier option to me. So let's have a look at some of the evidence. And I'm going to, like I said, please bear with me as I briefly skim across this evidence. The first one is, and one of the major ones, is the Big Bang. This is the prevailing cosmological argument for the universe and how we got here. It is the, uh, the agreement of all physicists, Christian or non-Christian. Stephen Hawking could not deny this as much as he would have liked to. Albert Einstein hinted at it while he was here. But the reason people like to ignore the Big Bang is they realise there's huge implications if there's a Big Bang. Why? Because we must have a Big Banger. (laughs) Edward Hubble in 1929, he was the man that developed the Hubble telescope. And in 1929, he observed that objects in deep space are moving rapidly away from us. And the whole world went, so what? But all of the scientists went, "Uh uh-oh, because immediately that he made that observation, it means that we don't have a static, eternal universe. It is moving. And if you press the rewind button, you come back to a point when it wasn't moving. You come back to a point when it came into existence suddenly and rapidly. And the first thing on the scene was light. What a coincidence, if you believe in those kinds of things. The Big Bang is logically leads us to the fact that it must have come from somebody who is intelligent. Let's, let's explore this more as we move along. Have you ever tried to answer the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Chicken. The chicken came first. Okay, that's interesting. Has anybody ever managed to answer this question, by the way? Ravi Zacharias would tell us that one of the greatest evidences that everything must have been created is that nothing can uh, account for itself in the living universe outside of itself. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example outside of the chicken and the egg. But if I had an apple in my hand right now and I asked you where do I get apples from, you would tell me you get them from an apple tree and you would be correct. If I then asked you, well, where do I get the apple tree from? You would say, well, you get it from a seed and the tree grows from a seed. Correct. Where do I get the seed from? Oh, we're back to the apple. Of course. Yes, of course. (laughs) Welcome to the scientist, everybody. The fact of the matter is we cannot account for anything in this universe that could not have come together in its full state. It must have been created as it is right now. There is in biological terms, there is a term called irreducible complexity. And that's just a weird and wonderful name for the fact that you cannot press the rewind button on any living organism and end up with the complete picture. What do I mean by that? I'm going to give you the example of a, uh, the sm- one of the smallest organisms on the planet, and that's called the flagella bacteria. An amazing little machine, and it's exactly what it is. The flagella bacteria uh, has a tail, it has a cog, a rotor, and a motor, and all of that is needed for this bacteria to survive, as biologists are beginning to understand. And what they also realise is, if you take one of those infinitesimally small pieces away, you don't have anything. You can't gradually end up with a flagella bacteria. And I want to tell you this morning, you can't gradually, over a process of however many years you want to use, come up with a human being. You can't. If you take the smallest valve out of your heart right now, you're gone. 
You can't gradually be here because we need all of you to be together. Irreducible complexity simply tells us that we can't press the rewind button. We didn't evolve. No one here came from a swamp. I pray that's good news for you this morning. (laughs) Another one is evidence to design. All of this evidence comes to us by empirical means, would say a scientist, and all that means is we are able to receive it by our physical senses. I want to point slowly away from facts now and start to begin towards to point towards the person. We have what I like to call evidence to design. It's strong evidence that points not away from God, but it points to him. And I want to give you an example of what I mean by design. Let's say you're walking along the beach. I've used this one before. Let's say you're walking along the beach and you kick your toe on a perfectly made Swiss watch. You pick up this watch and you realise that on the face of everything here, not only is it very well decorated and very well put together, but the hands move in accordance to regularity. Everything just seems to, just seems to work, brother. Just ticks along, just like it's supposed to. But then, like some people do, you take the back off the watch and you realise for everything to happen on the face, there's a huge amount of these small cogs and springs that are all working together. And if you take one of them away, nothing works, but it all seems to work together. And you know what? The first question you wouldn't ask is, I wonder how many years it took the ocean beating on the sand to form this watch. The first question you would ask is, who made this? Who's responsible for this? Because it immediately speaks of an intelligence that has put that watch together. I want to turn to fine-tuning now. And I couldn't explain it any better than the YouTube clip that I could find. And I couldn't remember half of the numbers. So I found a YouTube clip that I'd like to play for you, which gives us some idea of what I'm talking about with fine-tuning. Thank you. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. 
remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Microphone back on. When he looked up into the universe and he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. God is actually preaching a sermon to every single person every day. A sermon that says nobody else could possibly have done the fine tuning that we see there. This is the clincher for me though is morality. It was the clincher for C.S. Lewis in the end. If you read Mere Christianity, he points to morality being the clincher for him because inside of every single one of us, there is an intrinsic moral code. We just intrinsically know that it's wrong to do stuff. And there have been both secular and Christian people, explorers, who have discovered distant tribes but have found an intrinsic moral code of uh, not only do they reckon, recognise the same things we do as being wrong, but they recognise that there must be punishment and recompense. Who teaches people that? Nobody teaches them. It is inbuilt and ingrained inside of us. So many people will say, how could, there, how could there possibly be a God? There's evil in the world. And you're right, there is evil in the world. But I want to ask you, if there is evil in the world, how do you know it's evil? Well, I can measure it against this standard of good over here. Well, how do you know that's good? And how do you know that's evil? Why? We have a higher standard that allows us to see that. We all have this intrinsic moral code. If we don't have God, we don't have morals. Here's another one that uh, atheists are tripping over each and every day, and it's called DNA. Do you know every single person in this room possesses DNA? And inside of DNA, every single biologist admits the same thing. What we find in DNA resoundingly is information. In fact, millions and millions of pieces of information make up you. Every artist, Kate Farrant, will sign a masterpiece with a signature in the corner. And God has placed his signature on every masterpiece in this room. I don't care whether you think you're a masterpiece or not. I believe you are because God has placed his personal signature on you and I see it in DNA. DNA screams a divine hand is responsible in creation. Every living thing has DNA. I can remember watching a forensic file where they were convinced that a, a person had committed a crime and they could only place him there by a branch that they tore off his ute as he pulled away from the scene. They did the DNA on that compared to the tree sitting next to the riverbank and he was convicted resoundingly. Why? DNA cannot be, you can't argue with it. If you're in a court of law and they've got your DNA, you're gone. Because God put his fingerprint on you and you are an individual. You have individual DNA. I am thankful and so is the rest of the world that there's only one of me I couldn't handle another one. Stephen Meyer, a, a great apologist, he wrote the book, The Signature in the Cell, which is a great title for what DNA is. It is God's signature in each and every one of our cells, and it cannot be constructed by accident. I have given brief accounts of evidence that point to the existence of God, evidence that you can go and look for yourself. But you might be sitting here this morning going, well, so what, Pastor? I already believe in God. Great. What do you want me to do with all of this evidence? What do I do with all of the evidence that I have seen? I want to point you away from a what now to a person. Ravi Zacharias says that when you come to religion, you come to a place. I haven't come to offer you any religion this morning, but when you come to Jesus Christ, you come to a person. 
Let me read you some words from one of the greatest Gospels ever penned, the Gospel of John. And he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John writes to a Jewish audience, yes, but he largely writes to a Greek audience. And the thing with the Greeks and the Stoics and the philosophers, they had nothing better to do all day than talk about the ultimate explanation for the universe. They would sum up all of the information that would come to them. We, we find in the book of Acts that they would listen to Paul, they would listen to any voice that was something new for them, trying to understand the complete meaning of everything. John writes his gospel and says, you guys that are looking for the ultimate explanation, I found him. You're taking all this evidence that you can see. The, the Stoics could see the same regularity in the universe. The Stoics could see the same element of design. They knew there were patterns. John says, you know what? Everything that you see and everything that you observe and all that you're questioning and all the answers you want are found in one person, Jesus Christ. And then John goes on in his gospel to introduce us to the greatest man that ever walked the earth. He's the, he's the God man. And you can know him personally today. This is the greatest evidence for God. Is that every person in this room can know him personally and intimately and encounter him today. I want to talk to you about <coughs> this sentence in Genesis 1.26 where God says, let us make man in our image. In Matthew 22, starting in verse 15, you will, you will read a discourse between Jesus and a lawyer. And this lawyer, he wants to trap Jesus in his words. So he comes to him with what he thinks is an entrapment. And he brings a coin and he says, Jesus, he says, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Sounds like an innocent question on the surface, but I love what Jesus does with it. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, whose image and whose inscription is on the coin? And the lawyer answers him, it is Caesar's. And Jesus says to him, well, you give to Caesar or you render to Caesar what is Caesar's and you give to God what is God's. And the lawyer walks away and I wish he had finished asking the next question. Well, what is God's? And Jesus would have said to him, you render to God what bears his image. And what bears his inscription. And as we have clearly seen today, every person in this room bears the image and the inscription of a God. Of a God that is glorious. Of a God that is majestic. Of a God that is ever so powerful. But as we see in the person of Jesus Christ, he is also ever so personal. For each and every one of us. I'd ask the music team if they could come back as we finish with a quote from Ravi Zacharias that says, there is no greater discovery than seeing God as the author of your destiny. Each and every one of us here this morning, I would implore you, you, you may have been a Christian for five years, 10 years, 15 years. You may be sitting here this morning saying, I have never surrendered myself to Christ. You, you might even be sitting here saying, you know what? I surrendered some years ago and, and, and I've drifted away. Can I implore and encourage every one of you this morning to render to God what bears his image and what bears his inscription? Don't leave here today the same as you walked in. You don't have to. Let us pray. And if you need prayer this morning, if you need to grab hold of somebody and ask questions before you leave, then please do so. If you want prayer this morning, then I encourage you to come down the front. But... You might be sitting here this morning saying, you know what? I need to surrender to Jesus. And I've been, I begin to learn each and every day that I open my eyes. I've been a Christian for many years. I begin to realise I've got to surrender to Jesus every time I open my eyes. Every time I wake up, I've got to say, Jesus, I've got to do it again. I've got to surrender to you all over again. I've got to give you today all over again. 
But you may never have done that this morning. Or you may need to do that again yourself. I want to open that opportunity for you this morning. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you that we have viewed this morning the very smallest of the glimpses of your wondrous glory. I don't have English words that can express your glory. So I'm going to have to ask you to reveal yourself to every person in this room this morning. I pray that you would open every one of our eyes, open every one of our hearts. I ask. I know that you're not very far away from any of us. But may your word find its home in our hearts and in our lives, I pray, because it is your creative word that spoke everything powerfully into existence. Thank you, Father, that you so lovingly love all of us, that you sent the most important man in the universe, Jesus, to rescue us. We sing to your glory now as we conclude in your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you, worship team.